G'day guys. Um, back again with uh, our dear friend Mary Aradic. So she's uh, in Cape Town at the moment, and I'm sort of, uh, uh, you know, asked her to come on and uh, chat about her trip to Tanzania, the tribes that she went and saw, and some and you know some of the sort of nuanced stuff in regards to what new things she sort of uh, um, uh, acquired, you know, in terms of knowledge of that cultural side of. Um, uh, and the little the little nuggets of gold that many people miss when they go on these trips. I know Mary's one of those people like me, a details person, loves to literally into all nook and crannies and try to find those little bits of uh, um, gold where most people just look at at a surface level. She digs a bit further, and that's the reason why she was able to go through her own journey um, of nutrition and find new things. She has an open mind, which I love, um, because that's one thing we share as a citizen scientist myself. She's act an actual science researcher in nutrition. I'm just a citizen scientist, but I have the same passion for learning and understanding. And I hope, and I, I'm 100% sure that I will learn a whole lot of new things that I was not aware of when it comes to um, these um, tribal people. Anyway, I'll let you um introduce yourself uh, to um to everyone and also just give us a bit of a rundown mary okay great thank you so much so i'm mary ruddick and i'm a nutritionist and uh you know i spend a lot of my time not only with my clients working with a lot of people per week about 60 per people per week and thousands of people through the years but I really enjoy spending my free time doing a lot of research and going to places in the world where diets haven't been changed by modern commerce and even post-colonialism. So really pre-industrial era, pre-1500s, where I can see that uh, that stream of, of traditional health and uh, traditional diet and how they merge and why it is that some regions are very healthy and what has happened to us. So that's where I spend a lot of my time these days. And I'm, I'm currently working on a book of all of this, but it's gonna be a while because every time I go somewhere, I find more things to research, more places to go to. I'm, I'm really a fan of seeing if there's any exceptions to the rule and seeing why. And uh, why does that break the rule? And therefore, what is the actual rule? So uh, that's what I've been doing lately. I was in five countries in the the last two months. I was in Greece and then United Arab Emirates, uh, Tanzania, really four different sections of Tanzania, and then Uganda, and now I'm in South Africa. I'm hoping to go see the San on the 2nd. I have them scheduled in about a week. They're a more modernized version of the San in South Africa. You can't get the uh, the old school version, but they're actually pretty similar to the Batwa from what I've heard. We'll see if they are, uh, in that they grew up living the traditional way, so they still remember that, but they're now living a more, more modern life due to uh, government restrictions. Yeah, that's that is true. A lot of uh, you know the the bushmen, you know, they, they've been yeah. displaced and pushed to the edges. Um, all these yes. ecologists with their national parks have come and yes. the, world, the World Bank and uh, the International Monetary Fund have pressured these countries to create these wildlife sanctuaries. But the problem there is that they've taken one of the key predators which was the human element in those. And we've seen massive degradation in a lot of those parks. Yes. Yeah, it's really a shame. It's it's shocking how much the humanitarian and uh, environmental efforts have damaged the people here. Yeah. Um, and and mm -hmm. the, the problem is that they've pushed them into these shanty towns and you know their quality of life has de de degraded. Um, you know, yeah. the, the sort of... Uh, the foods that um, Western A price would have recognised populations living their traditional diet and populations that had moved um, to sort of uh, small towns that had access to a road and to a store and basically had transformed their diet, their, their levels of happiness had declined, their levels of, you know, you don't see that smile that you see in people that are, that are healthy um, you know, people that are sick, depressed, and whatever you don't, you you see a very different sort of uh, um, a weary sense. It's yes, it's, it's scary. Yeah, 
Before, before we started today, you were talking about some of the nuances, and I'll tell you, that was a shocking nuance that I took after this trip. I've, I've been to so many different communities, about 200 over the years, but the seeing so many communities in one month, it really was a bit shocking as to how different we conduct ourselves compared to someone who's on a traditional diet, living a traditional way. That kind of skulky look that a lot of us get, that kind of like cool, depressed, jaded look that we see in the media so often doesn't exist. It just doesn't exist. People are very happy, go lucky. It's almost like we've started to romanticize anxiety and depression and think that that's attractive. It's mind blowing. It's crazy. It's uh, it, um, look. The funny thing is, um, the more the more I've moved to an ancestral diet myself. I mean, I'm not perfect. I do cheat a lot. Um, uh, as a, I do declare, but uh, it's very hard when you're in this sort of a food environment. And even my subs, I know they they do. And I try to basically help them pick me up and me pick them up because it goes both ways. Um, it's difficult being in this food environment it's addictive you've got a lot of family and friends and people around you which are pressures the natural pressures you know um you know you from your own self being in greece and being around a sort of close-knit families how they can sort of pressure you to eat some stuff that you would not normally consume you know you would avoid yes. but under those circumstances you sort of succumb to be sociable in a sense, mm -hmm. you know, it's... Oh, it's very true. The yeah, great it, grandmas are pushy. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, they are. <laughs> Definitely, you know. Um, and, even with their, and even with their sons, they um, the mothers are very pushy. Mine, mine yes. was. <laughs> Yes. Oh, the, yes, definitely. They have a lot of power in their family and, and you don't want to upset them because they're really all lovely. So you really don't want to make them angry yeah, or them insult them or be rude. Yes. If you have them on your side, you're on a pedestal. Yes. The world is easy. It is. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so now, it's true. So yes. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Just go. You want to complete. Oh, I was going to say that, uh, yeah, you really have to have, if you're trying to reverse something, such a staunch inner strength of what you're doing and why, so that when you're in those situations, you don't care. Uh, about what anyone else is going through. And I find when you're in a genuine state of non-reactivity to the general public, you can get away with being on a strict diet without too much pressure. But the second you feel guilty, the second you're not sure if what you're doing is right, then uh, the yayas will just, and you'll be eating, you'll be eating all the, all the foods. <laughs> so <Exactly. laughs> it really, yes, it really does take an inner, an inner decision rather than an outward decision. So to give you an example, an outward decision would be going to a place and saying, I can't eat this. I can't eat that. I can't eat that. Right. It puts you in a victim mode. Whereas an inner strength goes, thank you so much for making all these lovely things. I'm doing this thing right now. I would uh, love to enjoy your food at a later date. And I'm so sorry, I can't right now, right? It's taking full responsibility for it as opposed to putting the responsibility on the other person for fixing your food. So really different situation, uh, gets a bit less reactivity. Usually you can get through smoothly, but it's an art to learn that. And it took yeah, me exactly. a long time. Exactly. I just, <laughs> yes. uh, even with dad, when I go over and he, you know, I'll have the foods that I, and I'll just leave the other stuff. And just one. Yes, that's anything. the easiest. It's way. it's exactly. easiest Push play. it around. Exactly. Yes. It, it, without um, <laughs> disappointing. Them. Making I, a thing of it. Exactly. You just. Yeah. You just ig ignore that it's happening. It's the yes. best way. <laughs> and it really helps to have a partner or a friend there, so that you can kind of break it apart on your plate and then share. And that's then no one notices well. what you're not eating. Yes. That is true. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know the you, you know the population over there too well. <laughs> yes. Now, now, in regards to um, your trip to Tanzania, um, which is the the key one we which we want to get into, um, which were the key tribes that you actually spent most of the time with? We spent the most time with the Maasai and then the Hadza and with different clans within those groups. Those are the ones that we definitely spent the most time with. Okay. One thing about the, the hunting um, approaches of the Hunza, um, mm -hmm. they tend to, it seems, is it, is it basically they go out for about um, six to eight hours? Is that right? That's right. I mean, it can really be 
two to 12 hours. It just okay. depends when they find the animals and then they come home. Okay. So on, on average, it would probably be about maybe five hours, do you think? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, now, they wake up. Obviously, they don't have any meals. They're in a fasted mm -hmm. state. So cortisol basically gets them going in the morning and, and basically they head out. Um, do they eat along the way? Do they pick anything? Do they? Um, nope. Nope, no, basically. it's fascinating. They don't eat or drink anything along the way. So really no snacking. Well, I can't say anything. There was one point. So we hunted with them a couple different days. Uh, one was a shorter day. It was like four or five hours. And another day was very long. And uh, they, they don't bring any food with them. They don't bring any water with them. They leave and kind of run out of camp. I mean, I had to almost jog to keep up okay. with their walking pace. So very quick. And, uh, and at some point they stopped to show us some things, but it was more to show us. It was less for them. So for instance, we had some honey. The hive was young, so the honey wasn't sweet. So we had more larvae. And then uh, there was one point where we stopped at a baobab tree, which grow everywhere. But they were getting some water from it. But the amount of water would have been a couple ounces. It wasn't very much so, water. Oh, so that, that's a bit like the cactus in a very similar way. Yes. Yeah. Well, that is deuterium depleted water yes that is low right. deuterium water so just you know i like to nuance things um it's a bit like the sand people with their water they get deuterium depletion water i mean i know that laszlo boris who's the hungarian out of um, ucla who does a lot of research in deuterium and he basically tends to say that he doesn't consume a lot of water as well um, i've tried to do that as well it's a hard thing um and try to eat more fat to get more deuterium depleted like metabolic water from fat yes. which is what i suspect these people are doing so they're upregulating their antidiuretic hormones over time so i yes. suspect this is what is actually happening with these people i think you're right i think there's a lot of credence to the deuterium theory like quite a bit and uh, yeah i have no doubt in fact the other tribes that we visited as well also had deuterium depleted water like the chaga which i didn't mention actually we spent just as much time with the chaga so it would really be those three tribes the chaga uh, have glacial water coming to their houses gotcha. so right from mount kilimanjaro so they also have deuterium so it's depleted fractionated water. water from much from a higher elevation that's right gotcha mm -hmm. yeah interesting mm -hmm. yeah um you that that's the thing that i actually noticed with it um from just scant um looking at certain tribal groups around now i didn't have direct contact with them but just general information um that i was able to get it's very hard which is the thing because it's so confounded and, and uh, most of the people that are actually collecting the information they it's just bits and pieces you can read between the lines sometimes and yes. But, you know, and that's why I'm asking you these questions, because I need to really, you know, what did you observe? I need to sort of confirm what I've heard and what you've seen, observed um, in, in the flesh, so to speak, which helps me understand. Because I know the sand people um, use a lot of deuterium depleted water from leaves and all that. And they put they, they actually um, basically get it out of the leaves by um, pressing on them to and get it and placing it into an ostrich egg. And that's how they... Yes. Um, they they move it around um so it's just it's really interesting you know the the, the this sort of using fat and deuterium depleted water as their source um of metabolic waters main water and that's why they're not so thirsty because you know right. the body to deplete deuterium has to constantly get rid of it so you're mm -hmm. You're urinating and you're actually the pool of water in your system. And if your insulin is high, you're not going to basically be producing enough metabolic water from lipolysis. So you're going to be in trouble in that regard. You're constantly going to be fighting that depletion um, uh, process. That's right. Sure. And they're also, in addition to that, they're also right by the equator. And so they're getting a lot of sunshine on their UV. skin and yeah. they don't, they don't wear much covering, which also helps to clear deuterium from the cell. That's true. And That's true. they're eating a low deuterium diet. They're not eating a huge amount of plants and they're not eating plants with a ton of deuterium. So yes, uh, all around. Yes, completely. I think our hydration or our hydration issues are very abnormal. The fact that we're all thirsty all the time, we need to to drink a lot. The fact that we carry these huge glasses, even just in 
the coffee culture in America. People are taking around these 32 ounce coffees all the time and huge water bottles everywhere and water bottles to school. Very abnormal even 30 years ago. So we've we've continued to need more and more water. And I think that's not just the deuterium issues. I think it's also the amount of stress we're constantly under. Stress mm. makes you, uh, deregulates the, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which can really deregulate vasopressin as well. And vasopressin mm. is the hormone uh, right. chiefly responsible for mm. hydration mm. and hydration within the cell. Mm. So I think we have a double whammy with the deuterium and that yeah. going on. I, I sort of mm -hmm. recommend, to, this is another reason why I recommend to people um, taurine um, as supplementation because yeah. it has a, an ability to um, increase GABA, um, you know, increase their parasympathetic and actually calm people down. So it has that calming effect, which is really important. Um, so, uh, you know, when somebody tells me the stress, I go, mm, I need to get you on slightly right. higher. But at the same time, you have to ask them because it does lower blood pressure, what your status is. I mean, traditional societies would get it directly from the food because they're eating a high animal food diet, which is heavily, is high in taurine anyway, naturally. Yes. So it's less of a problem, but uh, it's, a, it's an important um, sulfur amino acid that the body needs both for detoxing, but also for, um, you know, for a whole lot of other um, processes, but also the water side, the water side is really important. The osmo os osmolotic um, sort of uh, um, balance between the intra and extracellular, um, you know, side of water is managed heavily by, um, uh, by taurine. So it's one of those yes. really important um, nutrients. So I think that that's an element in it as well. I think it's a two, it's what you've said about the diet is really important. Um, the, the stress is really important. Um, but I think also the foods that we eat tend to make us more depressed and stressed. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's sort of, I always see things as a holistic thing, an interaction of complex interacting things most diseases are, are just a different manifestation because of your genetics, because of slight variations between different people and sort of manifest in different sort of pathologies or, you know, effects um, in a sense. But it's really part of the same milieu of sort of uh, um, dysregulation that comes with a modern diet. I mean, on the deuterium side, more sugar basically will dehydrate you because it's only basically produces 0.44 metabolic uh, um, mils of metabolic water per um, per gram of food, where water, uh, where fat produces 1.1. It actually hydrates, it doesn't dehydrate you. And that's what these traditional populations have learned, hydrating with fat and using metabolic water just as a supplementation to, to cover that sort of portion. Because for them, um, and also they're in the sun continuously. So every hour there, I think there's, it's an approximate, it depends. It's a sort of a rough thing. Um, it's a rough estimate that some scientists have sort of worked out. I'm, I'm not convinced that it's exactly precise, but it's a rough thing that about 19 parts per million are actually depleted every hour but it's a very rough thing. I think there's genetics in it. There's a whole lot of caveats when it comes to that. So unless we have good research, it's still to some extent a hypothesis. It's not actual theory at this stage, but I think it's an important thing. Now, I did want to touch on the actual, on the honey composition. Now, you guys, yes. what was the quantity <laughs> that, um, that it, it, this was shared out? What was the quantity yes. that everybody got? It was like that much, yep. but again, this is the, the beehive. So there's just a small amount of honey in that. Yeah. Exactly. And so and what is the quantity? Of, so it's, it's a, and that's what I wanted to say to people that yeah. beehives are basically what they are is long chain fats, which is an ester type, which is basically um, you connect an alcohol via an oxygen molecule. And that's how it's sort of composed in terms of biochemistry. And it's similar to similar to um, cholesterol in a sense, a waxy material. That's what it is. That's what beehives is. It's a, 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 it's their version um, of a, of a waxy structure. Ours is called cholesterol, um, but it's primarily made of long chain fats. And so you're actually getting more fat and very small amounts of honey. And that's the thing that I did want to want to focus. That the honey is not massive. You're out in the sun depleting yeah. that deuterium anyway. 
um, even though it is 200, 200 parts per million. But at that, at that level, because it is young as well, and it's not concentrated like, um, like normal honey, because um, I've been doing some research on, on bees and what they do is they have actually on their sensors, they actually send vibrations into the plant to detect the deuterium levels. Yes. So, right. so as a consequence, they can basically work out which are uh, the best to collect in terms of the concentration, because it's a growth factor for them in their beehives, obviously. Um, so it has a purpose. But uh, I, I suspected that it was a very small amount that um, probably the whole the whole bit, the whole bit probably mm -hmm. constituted probably 50 grams. And there was probably about five or five or six grams in terms of sugar in there or in terms of honey or at the most, I would say. I, I mean, I you saw you saw what you ate. You saw what you ate. Yeah, liked. yeah. It wasn't much at all. It didn't taste like five grams because gr five grams. That's a teaspoon of sugar. That that will actually taste sweet. It tasted more like two. Okay. Uh, of course, it's uh, partly seasonal, but it's not. You know, so often I had read, as I'm sure you have, that the Hudza eat uh, honey, so much honey and so much fruit and so many vegetables. And it's all seasonal and really their primary food is meat regarding, regardless of the season. That's right. So even in this season, we're at the tail end of the berries. We didn't see any uh, at all uh, on the any of the days that we were with them. But they didn't go out looking for these things. They went out looking for meat. And if they found other things on the way, uh, maybe they would get it. Maybe they It's wouldn't. a bonus. It's a bonus, but it's not like it's even less than a bonus because we passed hundreds of baobab trees and they weren't eating the seeds, which are delicious. Uh, they weren't eating the powder. They won't go. They weren't going for the water all the time. They went once in the entire long day hike, and uh, and yeah. So there was lots of things they could have been eating that they weren't. They were going for the baboons to eat them. So very different. Uh, yeah. And so with the honey, uh, sometimes they would go and get it. There were lots of honey hives that we passed or beehives that we passed but they didn't stop at any of them but one so so, so it's not so do you, so do you think they did it for, for you guys or or do, do you think yeah i do yeah i think they wanted to show us we had asked about the honey it's not really the season so yeah i think they showed it for us uh whereas everything else was kind of what they were doing anyway yeah 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 look sometimes uh, it's yeah what I think I think sometimes it's best not to ask and really just sit back, yeah. um, observe, and then ask right at the end. Um, yes. It's it's a it's a very hard thing to do because you want to learn, you want to, um, but sometimes you don't know yeah. whether as an observer you're interacting or you're affecting. No, that's true. So that's behavior. usually our MO. So whenever I go on trips, I don't even tell people I'm a nutritionist because I oh, get good. a very different. Yeah, no, I don't. This was slightly different because uh, Jay and Brian needed film footage for their okay. documentary. Yeah. So when we went, I told the guide who is a local and speaks the language fluently, uh, some things that we would like to get if it was in season, but not if it wasn't. So, uh, but I'm pretty sure they do the honey for anyone coming. You know, they're not a big tourism gotcha. thing. Thing, but they tend to do that because people want to see it. Yep. Yes. Fair enough. Fair mm -hmm. enough. It, 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 it makes good video. Video. That's true. You know, this, mm -hmm. lighting up the fire, you know, then smoking yeah. out the beehive. It's, it, yeah. yeah, there's a bit of exactly um, where their main, fo their main focus is get the meat. That's going to um, right. uh, provide the nutrition for the bodies. Um, uh, the honey's not, yeah. you know, not really totally in any way. Extra. Yeah. yeah, and I want to say too, because I certainly, um, you know, Brian and Jay are just the best. They were the best to travel with. I really loved them. So it's it's not that it was the documentary's fault that we got honey. It was that I conveyed that before we left. So it wasn't like we got there and we were like, yep. hey, we want to go see the honey. Uh, we did that months before because I didn't know the honey season in that region. So who knows if it affected it or not. But if it did, that's what we saw. <laughs> yes. um, what, how long is their honey season? How long? Is it a month yeah. or two? About a month? Yeah, usually it's just a couple of months and they don't save it for the rest of the year. They don't save anything for the rest of the year, even tomorrow. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, a lot of, uh, from my my own research, a lot of tribal populations just don't, you know, it's just one of those yeah. things that it's just, they don't have refrigeration. They don't have, um, you know, access to, to large amounts of salt beds and stuff like that to be able to access. So whatever salt they do, acquire they acquire from blood um and that's yes. the key th that's the key thing um yes. that they their, their main source um 
Well, they, they hit some occasionally, like all animals, when they're desperate for salt, they will go to salt beds. But generally speaking, um, you know, the tribal populations will try and get it from the blood and then um, interchangeable in that regard. So that you, you would have probably noticed that yourself. Yes, completely. Mm -hmm. Now, one other thing that I did, um, that I did, um, getting it back to the Maasai, which was the group that you, you spent most of the time. Now, obviously, we don't have to talk about the sodium side because I, I think we've covered that. It's coming from the blood, guys, because yes. there's a lot of potassium in milk. High potassium would basically cause a lot of problems if you weren't getting the blood. So people need to realize that. Now, on average, we've been told that the Messiah consume about four liters per day um, when they're actually primarily eating. Now, I did notice you did say that they consume primarily milk for a couple of days and then they have a big meat day and they separate yes. the two. Can you go into that yeah. a bit more? I'd be happy to. I think uh, Dr. Mann's studies specifically back in the day have uh, dispelled a, an improper myth by accidents, <laughs> actually. So the Maasai don't do milk every day. They, they do it when they're not eating meat. And so most likely, all I can deduct from what Dr. Mann said, who studied them back in the day, was that he was likely studying the men while they were taking the cattle during the dry season and going on their long walks. There's a short season where the Maasai will take the animals far away from their homeland and they do a lot of walking. And during that time, they don't tend to slaughter animals. They just do milk and blood every day. And so they're eating much more milk than they normally would. They still consume a lot of milk in the village, but it's not every day. So they'll do a few cups, two to four cups, depending, uh, every, like for three days in a row with the blood, and then they'll do a slaughter. So they usually slaughter about two animals a week. I'm sure it depends by village. This was the case in the three uh, that I spent time with, you know, a good amount of time. And, uh, and they'll eat all the meats and they'll do the meats with this kind of herbal stew, and then they'll switch to dairy and do the dairy and the blood, but they never do those things together. So the fact that a lot of these observational studies have been done and people come back and they're like, oh, they, they really don't eat that much meat. They drink a lot of uh, milk is uh, semi-accurate. It's accurate for a season, but not for a year round. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, mm -hmm. that's the thing that I, because I, I, I never could, I found it very strange. I Look, I know that because one thing milk is low in a number of nutrients, plus it is low in iron. Now, obviously, if you're using blood, you can get the iron and the sodium from the milk. So there's that option. Um, so it's coming from the animal. So it's not completely, you know, um, it works. Um, it has worked for them. But what is the quantity of blood in terms? Did, did were you able to sort of measure the quantity that they were consuming, or or estimate yeah. to some level of you know, um, yeah. good? So it was normal to drink one to two cups, one to two eight ounce cups, whether you were uh, having it straight after the kill. So if an animal was just slaughtered, you would have one to two and it, it's consumed very quickly before it coagulates. So I had one in the beginning after the kill and one at the end. The one in the beginning tasted like dessert. It was delicious. I can't okay. explain it. And then the one at the end was like a glob going down your throat. It was like jelly. And, okay. <laughs> uh, and they don't always eat that part. So they were surprised that I wanted it, but I wanted the full experience. And then <laughs> when we did it with the milk on another day, uh, very different. So, so when it's just the blood, one to two cups, eight to 16 ounces max. And uh, the higher up the person, the more they're gonna get. Like some of the guys would just go right into the animal and drink from the animal. Uh, so they're gonna get a lot more. And ironically, the guys who did that, they were the health of all of them like they really glowed with health and then and had perfect blood sugar we did test their blood sugars and ketones and that kind of thing and then when it was with the milk it was still the same amount eight to 16 ounces so that would be half as much blood and half milk so it would really be four to eight ounces okay so so so, ba so basically you're getting half and half in a sense you're not getting yes. so that so the the quantity in terms of milk you know, you're probably looking at a liter of milk and a, at Mac at on average max and a liter of blood. That's right. Sort of thing. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Because that makes better sense in terms of, um, you know, sort of low carb profile. 
Yes. It makes a better sense. Also, you're walking quite a bit. Um, mm-hmm. and, even a, and even a litre at five, um, you know, you, you're talking about 50, that's 50 grams of sugar. Yes. And that's, that's, right. that's, still, that's still low carb. That is still it low is carb. It is still low carb. You know? and, they and, also... and the other thing is, remember, half of that is galactose. So it still has to go through right. those four enzymatic pathways until it gets to glucose 6-phosphate, you know, so before it can exactly. go through um, glycolysis. So in that regard, it's that takes time. So you're actually yeah. stopping the rate. The There's a rate limiting factor how quick it gets into the bloodstream. So 25 grams is going to get in pretty fast in terms of glucose. The other stuff will get over an hour or whatever. They're quite active at the same time. They're repleting glycogen. So it sort of makes sense um, if you come, because I usually recommend people to combine it with bodybuilding and stuff like that, milk um, consumption and stuff like that with physical activity, not just sitting sedentary around and drinking milk. Um, So I usually tend in the evening, do a bit of um, lift of some weights and then I'll have the milk. Um, So yeah, that's good. Look, it's really good to know because there's a lot of misinformation out there um, and people have been talking about all sorts of levels. Some people talk about two litres, four litres, even five litres. And I, I always found that strange that they would consume that amount and you've got a whole tribal group that you'd have to basically, on average, I mean, you'd have to be basically, um, you know, literally at the other all day long trying to get the milk to get that quantity. It just didn't make sense to me. Um, no. So it's great that now we've got we're got informed information that it's about a litre and a litre of um, blood as well. So basically they are having, it's nearly, it's nearly having a, not only time restricted feeding, um, forget about that, but it's, it's basically they're in a catotic, in a semi catotic state, a low grade catotic state, and they're actually having um, calorie restricted days on the milk and blood. And then they hit um, the, the animal, the, um, the flesh of the animal. That's when they have a feast in a sense, that's right. every, that's every right. couple of days. Mm-hmm. And they are in a low grade ketosis. So they had very good blood sugar, really healthy blood sugar, no sign of diabetes. And they had 0.1 ketones. Every single person I tested had 0.1 ketones. It was the oddest thing. <laughs> so yeah, just very low blood ketones. Which is the, which is really, I've always, um, me and Bart sort of agree on that. It's the, it's one reason I moved away from um, uh, sort of the keto diet in a sense. I saw that it was just too extreme, um, that a population's really, you can't be in a catabolic state continuously in that state. It's not good for your thyroid. It's not good for a lot of um, health markers. You need to basically be able to swing in and out and be in that low grade, which makes far more sense. And that's what I thought the, the, with, the, with the higher level, as long as the sugar's not high and you've got a higher amount of protein, the protein doesn't really make a difference. What it does is it actually maintains a lower grade of ketosis, which is good um, in my opinion. And at the same time, it still keeps insulin under control due to glucagon. So the ratio is 1.3. So it's still around that sort of level, which is the key thing. And this is a sort of my understanding, um, but I, I've never had you know the opportunity to go to those places and actually observe it myself. Um, you're the eyewitness, so to speak, and and a person who's got a nutritional um, knowledge to be able to explain it better. Now, what other sort of subtle things did you notice with their milk consumption or behaviours? Oh. Full of bacteria, not not cooked, <laughs> and uh, really a lot of bacterial exchange from the women's hands, from the calves nursing as well. So just a big bacterial exchange put into a gourd that obviously you're not cleaning, right? Um, I, I think I've said in my other interviews, really, they're very tidy people. They're very elegant people, but there's a lot of bacterial exchange in this whole process. And so, uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. And they're prof- preferred food is still meat. When you ask them, like, what is your favorite food? Um, They prize the butter fat for the children. So they really do, they shake the milk and it's a high fat milk, you know, it's a whole milk. So they shake it for butter for the children. And that's primarily what the children eat when they come off of nursing or as they're combining the two. 
So I would say that was the main thing that the milk was not a daily thing. It was half a week that they do almost every week and more during the dry season and that it's consumed raw and typically combined with blood. Yes, exactly. Um, so the, so the actual, the actual children that are consuming this yes. sort of, this sort of milk, um, is it, is it the same with um, children as with adults, one-to-one -one in terms of milk and blood? It is, yeah. The kids everywhere, once they're past, say, two, are typically fed the same as the adults. So there's no such thing as a child's diet like we okay, do good. in so many of our countries, <laughs> yes. But I just, yeah, because um, mm -hmm. nobody's ever clarified this for me. Um, oh, Yes. Yeah. No, it's a good thing to point out because we've gotten so used to doing uh, short order chefing for our children. Like this child will eat this, this child will eat that. We eat differently from them. And no traditional culture does that. The kids no, eat don't. exactly the same as yeah. the adults. <laughs> yes. I mean, as, a, as a child, I ate, you know, even from a very young age, I could, yes. as far as back as I can remember, I still ate exactly what my parents ate. I didn't eat anything yeah. different um, in my Greek family, let alone when we were really young. Um, my parents really maximise the organ meats like um, brains, um, you know, livers, hearts, kidneys, um, the whole yes. lot. Um, I mean, that's so wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And that so, that ties in too, you know, with the everywhere we went, we would ask people what their favourite food was, what they were the most excited to eat, and the answer over and over was brains, baboon brains, this brain, dick dick brain. <laughs> everyone like not everyone, but about nine out of ten people loved the brains. That was a favourite food, and that's something you would never get a child to say in Australia or America, right? So, well, we've yeah. demonised those foods. That's, That's right. the thing, and and yeah, we've and we've made them. them and we've made them yucky. The word yes. is yucky, and it's a and shame. Thing. It's a shame because it's full of coenzyme Q10. It's full of all of these things that everyone is taking in supplemental form instead of just getting it in Precisely. the food. Yeah. yeah, my family was the same, and I think you know I'm one of five kids. I think when you have more than one or two children, you can't short order chef. So that was never a thing in America either until the last thirty years when people went down to one to two children. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. You know, the little princess and um, princesses. Yeah, 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 that sort of uh, <laughs> that that era. Yes, it's yeah. and unfortunately, you know, with the with the actual diet that they're on as well, um, which tends to, you know, create these mood swings and all that sort of stuff. I mean, yes. one thing that I think you've you'd notice is the kids. Yeah. The kids are totally different. The kids are how I remember children being way back in the day. <laughs> They're very snuggly and open. In all of my weeks there, I didn't see a single temper tantrum. I didn't see anyone upset. I didn't see anyone. Uh, the mothers never were woken up in the middle of the night by the children. The children all sleep through the night. Their temperament is calm. It's so calm and loving. It's like a teddy bear. <laughs> they're all like teddy bears. You can just pick them up and snuggle them and they're fine with whatever you wanna do. Do you wanna strap them on your back and go pick things out of the field? Do you want to sit around a fire? Do you want them to peel potatoes? They'll do it all. Like <laughs> they'll do whatever you want. And they're just very easygoing and nice and friendly and sociable, lots of eye contact, lots of smiling. They have a resting face that's very relaxed. So you might think just from pictures that maybe they're not very warm, but the second you engage with them they light up like a Christmas tree and they're lovely and they run towards you and they give you hugs and even if they've never met you before they'll just That's run nice. and give you hugs yeah so completely different you don't see any signs of anxiety depression nervousness OCD uh, you see none of the ADD ADHD no autism we went to several schools where the tribes kind of filter in and all the children will go to these English style schools and they'll walk a long way. So you'll see like 450 children together. And we got to go to several of these and spend quite a bit of time. And uh, not only through observation, but I was also asking the heads of the schools and the teachers, you know, if they saw any signs of, if they knew what the conditions were like autism, uh, anxiety disorders. And then also I would ask about symptoms, like do the children make eye contact? Do any of them stay off by themselves? Do any of them have a hard time with sounds? Uh, are any of them not social? Can they not make friends? And all the time the answer was just no. Like, what do you mean? 
(laughs) So yes. Yeah. No, the kids are in great health and it's, uh, it's very eye opening because it's become so normal for children to be in therapy and to have so many diagnoses and to need accommodation because of this, that, or that. Uh, and yeah, it just doesn't exist. I just remind people, um, Mm -hmm. just do a, a Google search on PubMed and um, put fat soluble, any of the fat soluble vitamins and any of these diseases, autism or whatever. And the amount of associations are just endless. You know, yes. we've taken out the, the high quality animal fats and we've replaced them with industrial poisons. And we wonder why the kids and a lot of the adults are in the state they are, you know. Yes. And that, so circling back to what you said earlier about ketosis and not using the higher fat ketosis, there are cultures that do use that. Um, So it is safe to do long-term, but it is uh, extreme to us because it's so different from what we do. And it's not a common thing. It's the thing you see in some areas. So it's more of the way that I see it is more of a tool. There are situations like certain conditions and certain people I have that do better at 6.0 and above ketones, like their neuropathy goes away. But it's usually the way I use it, and I don't know if it's the right way, but I tend to use it as a crutch. And then really maintenance would be that very low grade ketosis or just metabolic flexibility, not even being in ketosis. The goal and really the picture of health in my mind is metabolic flexibility. So if you eat carbs, you're not having a huge spike. If you um, eat carbs, you can get into ketosis the next day. You should be very flexible and be able to go in and out with ease and suddenness. And if Mm. you don't have that, then it can be used used as a tool I, th- I think the element the 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 big element with high levels of ketosis like that therapeutic levels of ketosis what i see it as um people have been on a on a very high carbohydrate diet yeah. for a very long time they've caused a lot of derangement in their body yes. a lot of senescence in their cells yeah. and and a lot of mitochondrial damage and so the way i see it is when you go to those levels, what you're doing is you're displacing, you're actually rapidly deuterium depleting um, in a sense. And you're basically really cleaning out the the system and giving the body the capacity for repair and healing. Um, So, so I agree with you completely. Um, You know, a tribal society that is basically somebody that's grown a tribal society on a clean animal based diet for a very long time is not going to have these problems, these derangements, and they don't need to do these sort of things. But uh, people that are that are really deranged in the modern world, um, yeah, it is a, a very good biohack. I, I don't disagree. You know, I sort of recommend it myself. Um, where I find people that are in that sort of deranged state, um, but if yes. they're not, um, and it's just sort not of necessary. The, it's it's not necessary <laughs> um, uh, for a lot of people. But it it, it, it all it's all always um, sort of nuanced and how long they stay in that state and how, when they swing back and all that, and the sort of support stuff as well. I tend to also totally up agree. a bit, up a bit slightly the selenium. I don't go really crazy, but I, I try and keep it at least at 300 micrograms. And the reason for that is um, to support the, the sort of, well, you've got two elements. If they're getting, if they're getting enough nutrition and they've got a, a lot of tissue they will recycle a lot of that re- t- tissue. So I'm not really, because there is muscle sparing. And at the yes. same time, you've got, you've got um, additional tissue, which becomes available um, as you're losing weight. So don't really have a big problem there in terms of holding up slightly and keeping down slightly reverse T3 to mm-hmm. support slightly the thyroid. So it, it's not in that chronically low um, sort of um, state um, in a sense, but not, you don't want to temper it too high as well because that has a wasting effect as well. So it's sort of a, a very you know, fine line to, let's put it that way, when it comes with selenium. It's an art form. Yeah. It's an art form. And it, it's, it can be necessary or useful. It can be useful for those who have really damaged mitochondria that are on the lactic acid energy yep. system instead of the ATP, they That's don't right. have a choice of using carbohydrates for energy. And so if they only have low ketones, it won't give them enough energy for their body to function. So yeah, there's times to use it and times when it's not necessary, but I think the goal is always to get someone, someone uh, to a place where they don't require it. It's just there if you want it, <laughs> which awesome. is always better. Yes. <laughs> That's, that's exactly it. Um, the um, getting back to the um, 
to the Hanza um, group mm -hmm. as well. They, we've covered, um, do, do any of these, um, do either the Hanza or the, um, the Maasai, do they actually consume any plants in any season whatsoever? Or? Yes. Yeah, so the Hadza, so different tribes will consume different things based on where they are. Really, the one thing that I've seen that strings all of these together is that they eat from where they are. And so it's going to depend what's in their season. And that includes the like two different groups of Hadza, maybe on the same mountain, but a different region of the mountain will have very different food. So for instance, the first group that I spent time with, uh, you know, they've all been displaced. So they can't get big game anymore like they used to. So they're stuck with this kind of small game. But they lean, lean, uh, lean uh, meats. Really yeah. very lean meats. Gosh, very mm. lean. Yeah, yeah like tiny a, deer. Yeah, yeah tiny that, antelope. That forces you towards mm. towards tubers for your energy. It does. It does. So this first group, they only eat tubers about five, six months of the year, berries for two to three months of the year, uh, honey for one to two, and uh, and not a ton of plants, way less than had been reported before, right? And all the people going to see them. Uh, I saw some green leafy uh, vegetables being eaten, specifically the leaves of the pumpkin plant, the wild pumpkin. Again, that's not native to that region. That's an American plant, but it's there, it's in the wild now. And then the second headset group, which honestly was much healthier, <laughs> much healthier than the first, they had a uh, zero influx from modern food, like the first group does, which I should say they had small amounts, but little bits from tourists. They also had some toxins coming in through their rolling papers for, they smoke, yeah. they smoke tobacco yeah. and weed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were doing maize in the dry season because they don't have access to the large animals. So it's still not a large amount of Maze, but some uh, and mm. really not enough to account for the kind of uh, health issues that I saw with them, which would be most Americans and Australians wouldn't even see these as health issues because they're so much healthier than we are. Gotcha. But in comparison yeah. to other groups, they do have them. They actually you notice have subtle them. differences. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And they were apparent to me because of seeing all these different groups to someone else who hadn't gone to lots of different groups, they would not be apparent or they wouldn't be significant. I don't think because you would just think like, wow, these people are amazingly healthy. They have no chronic disease. This is incredible but they do have things that we don't see in people that don't eat the, any of the modern foods. So there, there is some differences, um, albeit minor. The second group of Hadza really didn't, uh, and they can be Hadza, Hadzabi, they're known by different names, just in case you guys are out there like yep, researching gotcha. and you're like, what is this group? What's that one? They're all the same. Uh, so it's all the same term or the same group. The second group really didn't have influx from any tourists coming in or anything like that. No maize during the dry season because the dry season didn't affect them as much, but they ate more of the cassava, the tapioca roots. So they would eat those year round instead. But when I say that they're really doing a lot of the actually deuterium depleted water from it. So they'll strip away the fiber and kind of drink from it oh. and maybe chew on it a bit and then spit it out. So it's not consumed the way you and I would. It's not made into a flour to make baked goods it's not stir fried these kind of things aren't done maybe they make it into a soup at some point and and that's something that's different as well with these groups you don't see all these different cooking methods it's basically like roast over a fire or put in a pot with water you don't see like deep frying you don't you don't see lots of the modern cooking methods mm. i would say it's more simple and clean uh although many of them are high fat that really varies by group so i don't want people to take away that like no one fries that's that varies the the group in gosh where was i zanzibar the village in zanzibar they deep fry everything and that's a tradition there but they had a lot of coconut oil traditionally so so yeah you see differences in coconut how oil. long they would eat these different things yes yeah that's their native okay. in, in zanzibar mm -hmm. interesting yeah i didn't yes. realize that Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, their traditional foods in Zanzibar are the coconut oil, which was uh, about 50% of their diet would come from. And then they would do the cassava, they would do goat, uh, fish, wild game as well. So a good amount of meat and fish. And then uh, some like greens and things growing is essentially kind of what their diet looks like. Before. Well, greens are like deuterium it's, foods anyway. So they're, that's they're right. pretty much. That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. you know less of an issue um in that regard yes um what about the the maasai do mm -hmm. they do I, they i've heard do. that the, the women mm -hmm. eat pro it's more the women rather than the men uh -huh. and they eat some vegetation 
So what yeah, sort so of this take? depends by village. And so I think any five people going to visit five different Maasai villages will get a different takeaway from this because different villages have adopted to modern foods at different rates. So uh, I went to three different huge examples, one that really had been eating corn and beans for a long time. But again, that's all they're eating. They're doing corn, beans, and vegetable oil. Those are the only modern foods they've brought in. They haven't brought in things like ice cream or potato chips or anything like that. So they're are doing they, are, the they traditional... are they still consuming raw milk? Yeah. Um, milk? Yeah, so they're still okay. doing raw milk. They're still doing the blood. They're still doing the meat. They're still doing all of those things. But this will be like one meal a day or something will be like that. The, the maize, the beans and the vegetable oil. That would be the most and, and the, modernized. And the milk, the milk, is the milk raw? Some of them have started cooking it because of the schools. Okay. The schools are telling the children to do this. Oh, so damn. some of them are cooking it. We only saw one, one house that was cooking their milk. Yeah. Uh, but that could have been for, for pregnancy because the Maasai okay. always cook the milk for women past month six of a pregnancy. So it could have been that. But yes, because of the bacterial load. That would be my assumption. Okay. Yeah, that would be my assumption because they go from raw liver and raw things to cooked things just for those three months. As soon as the baby is born, they go right back to the all the raw. So it's a, just three months those things are cooked. Uh, and then there are Maasai that on occasion will have maize, but it's not common. It's like very rare. Or they're growing maize, but they're not eating it themselves. They're growing it to trade for cattle. That's very common. So it would be easy to go to a village and see corn being grown and think, oh, these guys are eating corn, but you talk to them and they're actually not. So you see that as well. Eat, and which is fair. That's enough. right. They trade it. Yeah. And then you've got the third, which are the real traditional that don't do any of the modern foods and don't want to. And a lot of them, they're very interesting because they'll often go to towns for college. They'll go to college and then they'll come back and they'll prefer this kind of life. So it's it's very interesting and they fully go back. They wear the clothes, they do the diets, all the kind of things. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, did, I did, I remember you saying something about a factor in the milk um, with lectins yes. and I did, um, yeah. I did drop that on one of my live streams that it was lactoferrin. Um, yeah, and colostrum. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that you know that that plays that plays the role. And I reminded my subs that it's not a license to go out and get yourself supplemental lactoferrin to basically consume high lectin foods because yes, it does bind. But remember, a lot of the traditional populations, even in Europe, whether in Greece or whether in the Swiss Alps, these populations used to had low like zea bread is about has much lower levels of lectins and yes. gluten and then they fermented yeah. it so before they and they consumed it in small amounts as well so That's combining right. with um, raw milk yes you can mitigate some of those anti-nutrient effects yeah. um, of the lectins um, but it's not a license to basically let's supplement um, it's just basically no. <laughs> that it, it's to understand why certain European populations, pastoral populations, and even um, po pastoral populations in other parts of the world have consumed some grains and have got away with it in the past because of raw yes. milk. And it's um, those factors in there that can that are protective. Yes. Would you like and to go into it a bit more? Compare it I would love to. And why we can't compare it to our grain consumption today, because the, the way that we're consuming grains is completely different, right? So uh, take Japan with white rice. People aren't having pork with their white rice anymore. So they're not making up for the thiamine or take Europe That's with it. their grains. Yeah, the gluten would be reduced from 72 parts per million to 12, right? So completely different picture. Um, or 72,000, sorry. And, uh, and so you wouldn't have to block as much, but it was there to protect you if you were. And they're also living and eating in a completely traditional format with bacterial exchange and light exposure and low stress and not with damaged microbiomes, not That's with right. C-section births and antibiotics and working all night and, and light good, exposure. And good, and good vitamin D status to basically seal up those mucosal layers as well. Exactly. Completely different story. Oh yeah. Let's talk about that. Their hormones are healthy. You, I, 
I never get a new patient with healthy hormones. They don't have good uh, testosterone being produced or uh, not be too dominant in estrogen. Something is off. They're either not producing, they're overproducing, they're imbalanced. And vitamin D is a hormone. So I'll see a lot of people who try something like carnivore and they get their blood tested and they're doing a lot better maybe, but their vitamin D still isn't up. And that's an indication like your hormones are not fixed yet. You still have work to do. That's and awesome. uh yeah, and you don't have that in these cultures that are doing that. So my observation and they was forget, just and they to help explain. that the gut microbiome also requires vitamin D. The yes. beneficial bacteria love exactly. vitamin D. I keep on exactly. reminding my subs. <laughs> yes, yeah, because it can be consumed at a faster rate than you're producing it. That's the problem. <laughs> I know. Yes. So um, I, I, I do say to people that if you're living in colder climates, um, it's the reason why I've said, you know, once I finish with Tasmania I, I, and I retire in five and a half years, I'll be moving to warmer pastures where I can access um, the sun on a regular yes. basis. Yes, I think that's so wise. Yeah, the sun is so important. Yeah, I mean, supplements, uh, I, I, I've never liked supplements. And even then, I've gone for the most cleanest possible, but it's still not the perfect solution. The sun is the best. Right. You know. Yeah, it can be used short term in an emergency situation, but long term, you want to fix your diet and lifestyle. Yeah, precisely, precisely. Mm -hmm. um, any any final any final points, um, things that we may have missed? Um, something about these people that sort of stuck yes. in the mind. I would say my biggest takeaway from viewing all of these communities and spending time with them was how radically unhealthy we are. Even the healthy of us, the healthiest of us who feel like we're in good health, maybe we just have like a minor allergy three months a year or um, a little, you know, maybe you're not regular with your stools, whatever it is, it's not normal. Like none of that is normal and none of us are normal. Uh, our real state is that of perfect peak health, both mentally and physically. If you're waking up down, if you're having mood fluctuations, if you're grumpy, if you're reactive, if you have insomnia or you don't sleep well, anything that is not literally perfect is a sign of disease. And it was shocking how different we are, even the most healthiest of us to what we can actually be and what I think is our normal state. And that is real perfect peak health. So, you know, when I see, I'm gonna have to temper myself going forward, to be honest, because when I see teenagers right now, they look so depressed and anxious, you know, and I'll see them with chewed fingernails, with white spots all over their nails. All of these are big indications of major problems in the body. And if you talk to their parents, they'll be like, oh, they're just being a teen, you know, they don't have cancer or they're fine. They're not, they're actually not fine. So not I exactly. would, yeah, I would use any symptom that you have as motivation and fuel to dig deeper, try more things, investigate, uh, experiment, see how you can get to another level. One thing I've found since healing so many years ago is that every single year gets better. And every year, I don't think it's even possible to get better and it does. So we're never done unless we're living that way, which isn't gonna happen. So I would say, just keep a curious mind, keep exploring and don't settle for less than perfect health. Yeah, it's perfectly said, perfectly said. I mean, I find myself that every year as it goes past, I get better myself. Um, I try to get as much grounding in as possible, um, out in the sun as possible. Um, I've got, luckily I've got a stand up desk at work, so I can use that. Um, you know, I've also got a program from the Tasmania university. What it does is it locks up my computer every 45 minutes, forces me to walk. So I That's go, fantastic. I walk from the second floor up to the ninth floor and back down again. And I um, sort of do that at a, at, a, at a good pace. Sometimes I have to slow down because there are other people coming and you smile and they go, <laughs> what are you doing, Harry? <laughs> so, you know, what is he I doing? <laughs> Jogging, you know, so, but I do that sort of, I do that sort of stuff. I get up to the top and sometimes there's, there's a lady there. She, um, I won't mention her name, um, but uh, she goes, were you jogging, Harry? Yeah. <laughs> Does it show? <laughs> so I, I sort of do a few of these. A few of these. It's, it's sort of high intensity as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you have to stop 
and sort of um, somebody wants to go to the toilet, you know, you sort of, um, after you, you know, you let them go past and, you know, being polite and then just keep on going after that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's enjoyable. I, I, I do these sort of things. And I mean, most people say, why don't you go for a walk? Yeah. I walk down from my place down to the North Hobart Post Office and I walk straight up the hill up to Mount, um, yeah. Mount uh, uh, Stewart, so the top there. And I, I do that on the weekends and I do it deliberately because it just gets my heart rate up. It's a quick, uh, it doesn't take long to get up, up up there, but at the same time, it's really at a, at a high tempo. So, um, and then I get up there, I sort of try and get my breath, try to recover, try to come back to life. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. But but you need to do those sort of things um, out there. I mean, what they do, as you said, they're earthing themselves constantly. They're sleeping, um, you know, they're in proper circadian rhythms. They are in sync with the planet. Um, you know, they are exposing themselves to practically no blue light in the evenings. Right you know, all this sort of stuff. Or toxins. It's, they're yeah, not exactly. exposed yeah. to industrial toxins or air pollutants. And their flexibility is incredible. I mean, their hip flexibility, all of them at all ages is incredible, which leads to perfect posture, which allows you to produce serotonin correctly and other things. So Precisely. yeah, yes, it's the nuances and they, they make a big impact. The thing, that's the thing that most people don't understand that, that, yeah. that the human body is the physical the physical and mental are one, the physical and mental state and, and the environment are in constant interaction with your genes. You know, you're basically, basically your epigenetics are in constant, basically being influenced by that environment. And that is really hard for a lot of people to, to understand the importance. I mean, I sort of put my blue blocking glasses and have different types of glasses of a different, um, you know, I'm about to change over to these ones soon, but you know, people just don't realize that I've changed all my light bulbs um, in my yes. home. They're all blue blocking um, and yeah. eventually this will go off and the red ones will, um, will get turned on um, once we get past eight o'clock. So, which it's is in so half good. an hour. So it basically all that constant transition, um, which makes a big, a big difference to my sleep um, compared to the past. Uh, where I was getting some interruption now and then and all that, where now I just go, I'll sleep and I'll just go right through, wake up. Um, I don't feel tired in the morning. Um, I'm more pleasant with people. I notice because other people say, you're so chilled out, Harry. You're so cool. You, you're always smiling, you know, and I realize all these things that I'm doing, it's not only the diet, but it's also the environment that I've modified to some extent. It seems that all of it sort of, is helping. Um, it all uh, helps. Of, yeah, I have to tell you about a client of mine. So she was really interesting with this smile thing in that I was worried. So she's been sick for many, many decades. She's elderly. She's in her 70s and very chronically ill. And she seemed like someone who just needed to be on the ketogenic diet. Like you could see the lactic acid issues and all these things. So it's like, okay, well, we'll switch you into that. Well, despite all her diagnoses, what they missed was mast cell. They missed histamine. And so a histamine person, if they have beyond a certain threshold of histamines, they won't do well that's, on the ketogenic right. diet. Yeah. And so when I saw that, I switched her over to carnivore, which is great for histamine disorders and uh and immediately suddenly for the first time she's smiling she's laughing i had never seen this woman's like actual personality and once we got her histamines down she was a delight i do these dietary groups now and she's in them and i'll see her little face like laughing i see her teeth i had never seen her teeth before Which she was nice. a stiff jaw nice. <laughs> as you can get yes exactly so yeah it's it's a natural state and anything that makes you feel happier uh is good and if you're not feeling happy even if your other health is good your physical health is good you've got something to work on i've i've, I've even noticed that in my father you know he's 86 yeah He's much more pleasant now at 86 since he's mm. been, since his mid 60s, 70s, when he was starting to get sarcopenia, it was, it was muscle loss and all that. And I got him onto more meat and that was a struggle mm. to get him to eat more meat and to do some little weights. I got him some weights to do some mm. weight um, lifting and stuff like that. He does it in the morning and in the evening. Um, he takes taurine. He, he does a few other things. Um, some sulfur amino acids like MSM, which is really good also for, 
because I always remind him, I said, Dad, you know, um, for your hair, for your nails and all that, you need more sulfur. Um, and so, you know, as you're getting older, you do, you will go through far more sulfur because it's a, um, required for detoxification. Your body okay. will will basically require more. So, and that's helped him improve. But what I've noticed in the last couple of years, he's much more content and much more happier. Yeah. So, you know, which is... I mean, he, dad, dad was, you know, had fairly clean diet. He was much, much better. But at the same time, he's much better now. And yeah, I can, Good. I can attest to that as well. I'd like him to sort of move further to to carnivory, but he, it's, it's a work in progress. Let's oh. put it that way. It's hard from his cultural background and you know the way he's been brought up. So it's not an easy thing, as you can understand. Um, yeah. But he's responsive and he's seen an improvement. The more meat he consumes, so he's less, you know, because I mean th that generation was to a large extent influenced by you know the experts, you know, to yes. a large extent. And so. Um, you know, luckily now that he realizes, well, they, they weren't so great. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's really good. good. I know you've got another, you've got to be Thank somewhere you. else as well. Mm -hmm. I've loved chatting with you. I, I want to do it Thank again. Um, at some Sounds great. Future, future date when um, you've got some free time. Um, if you do want to drop into one of my um, live streams um, in the, um, in the not too distant future, drop me a line. You know, they're I always the, fun. I'll absolutely I, do that. I, I, I <laughs> do. I do them on on the on the Sunday. I will. I will Great. drop your line for the next one. Okay, that sounds uh, I'll good. Se I'll send you. I'll send you a link. And uh, um, if you've got time, any time you can drop in for a few minutes. There may be a few questions people want to ask in that regard. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure because there's so many nuances and there's just not enough time to go over all of them, especially with this many groups of people, right? We didn't even get to the Datoga, the Chaga, the Batwa, all of those groups as well. There's so many nuances. So yeah, I encourage your followers, ask the questions because sometimes you'll be surprised. By yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. Because yeah. there's going to be things that <laughs> I've missed and they will, they will ask me or they want to ask mm -hmm. you, which is always yeah. the case. Now, which other groups are you going before you head back to Europe? Um, <laughs> which other groups are you going to see? Definitely going to see the sun. So I'm going to see the ones in South Africa, which are the mm -hmm. most modernized the last 30 years, but they still remember. And then I'm hoping, you know, it's going to depend on borders and what's open. I'd like to get to Namibia because there's some real interesting groups there. Uh, we'll see they're nomadic. So you never know if you can actually get to them or not, especially with my work schedule. But I'd like that, to try that. Uh -huh. Isn't is there a pastoral, a pastoral group as well in Namibia? Yes, there are so many. Namibia really has quite a few cultures okay. that are still living their traditional way. It's a very unique place and it's kind of a darling of Africa. My friends who grew up here in Africa in different regions, Zimbabwe, South Africa, these kind of places, uh, Nam uh, Namibia is often their favorite place to go for vacation. Okay. And I was like, Who? what? <laughs> but it, apparently it's really beautiful. So yeah, I'd like there to go for go. a number of reasons. Hoping to get back to Uganda, I plan to stay there much longer. And there's some groups that I really want to go see in the Northeast, kind of in the war-torn areas, South of Sudan. Be and safe. then, yes, I'll have to be, yeah, no guarantees. And then also Zimbabwe will be had as well before we go. And then Hopefully hopping over again, all of this is tentative right now with coronavirus, but hopefully hopping over to South America and doing some groups there, Central America, and then headed uh, back to America to see my folks and my friends. Oh, fair enough. That's, all before that, that Europe. pretty good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you. All right. You. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was delightful to spend time with you. No, different. Look, thank you from me. You know, it's been, it's been great. I've really really enjoyed it um you know thanks for being here i think uh, we've we've learned a lot um uh, you know in terms of some of the subtle nuances in regards to you know that part of the that part of the world luckily there are still some people on a species appropriate diet um that we can learn from um and uh, and you know the sort of those little nuggets of gold that I was able to tease out of you. Um, I, I know that my subs will appreciate them quite a bit. I do, believe me, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And you're, uh, and you're, a, you're a great ambassador for um, traditional cultures. Um, uh, you know, 
I and I'm, I'm saying that you know I do appreciate because there are very few people out there that actually have their heart in the right place that are going out there to represent these people in their true way. Um, no hiding, no no manipulation, no you know playing down certain things, but exactly really what you observed and what you saw. Um, you know. I've learned something today, especially when it comes to the um, milk consumption, um, something that I wasn't aware of. I thought they consumed far more um, and a number of other things which, uh, you know, have cleared up in my head. And I think for my subs uh, have given us a better understanding. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you and... so much. All right. We will see you soon. Bye.